The Carnegie Mellon University Oral History Program records the real-life memories and perspectives of those who experience the history of Carnegie Mellon. These interviews don't just inform listeners of the event's histories. They tell the story of how the events were experienced. He said, a librarian is the only profession that African Americans do not have in the city of Pittsburgh. Why don't you apply to Carnegie Institute of Technology, and if they don't accept us, come back to us and we'll go to bat for you. So I applied. These lived experiences intersect with poignant moments of artistic, technological, and social change in our society. I thought, maybe I can write computer programs that would entertain me as much as what I'm doing with my subconscious. So I started trying to program the computer to make art. They were expecting the new G20 computer. My job, so I could learn what it was all about, was to write the manual for the rest of the students. And I learned fast <laughs> because until recently, you did not get a manual with a computer. And worse than that, the circuit of robots began to explode. <laughs> we fixed it uh, and then barely made the system work uh, a few to several days before the Super Bowl. As one of the few oral history programs in Western Pennsylvania, we support Carnegie Mellon and our broader community by recording interviews and providing oral history services and consulting. We preserve the interviews in the university archives for current and future generations and share these histories through podcasts and educational and public programming. Yeah, Carnegie Mellon education for me validated, gave me that validation that I think as an immigrant's child, you don't have. I don't care, I don't care who it is who's going to tell you you're, you're worthy, you're still an immigrant's child, and your parents still speak broken English. It was a magical place at that time. I think magical in the sense that whatever was going on in that building, four Nobel Prizes came out of it. It's, it's hard to say exactly what made it so wonderful. We were all enthusiastically learning about everything we could learn about. Nobody cared about grades. Nobody cared about graduation because we knew we were either going to pass the quals and get a dissertation or not. These would take, life would take care of itself. We could spend our time learning. Our work is made possible through support from our generous donors and community. So they created a pro computer program, of course, that uh, would take a wheel of cheese and people had a week to say, oh, I'd like Jarlsberg and I like Havarti and I like this and that. And we did some of Creepshow style on campus. We did a scene out in front of Margaret Morrison we did some hallway shoots in there. There's one section of it called the crate, and there was a, a critter that, that, that escapes and eats people. I couldn't afford to go back to Carnegie Tech. I would now have to tough it out on the street and learn what, uh, uh, take that poison that appealed to me. And what was that? It was a populist insistence that music is very important. It's more important fund fundamentally than politics and the pursuit of that. The arts are not a decoration. The arts are essential. Andrew Carnegie was right to put his bang in these bucks. From the origins of artificial intelligence to the sets of George Romero's films, these are the stories of Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs>